And I'm going to turn it over to you, sir. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Rachel. Thanks for the introduction, and thanks for inviting me up to Shiloh Museum to share uh, information about the Civilian Conservation Corps and what they did at the park. And uh, Devil's Stand, that's just, the CCC is really, we are taken with them, and we one of the things we really like to talk about. So uh, I will get started. And with this first slide, as you can see, uh, that's one of those entrance signs, the Devil's Den, for one of the first camps, which wasn't located in the park proper as we know it today. It was about five miles away from the park. And I want you to take notice this, we can take it. And you'll kind of see that slogan off and on. So we'll kind of talk about that a little bit later and uh, kind of what it meant and what it meant to the uh, uh, young men. First, we should probably start off with the 32nd president, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who was elected in 1932 and took office in uh, 1933. And back then, uh, the inauguration took place in March. And so I believe it was March 4th that he was inaugurated. And it wasn't long after that, about six weeks or so, he started a lot of programs. Obviously, as you all know, it was the Great Depression at the time. A lot of people out of work. And Roosevelt, part of his new deal was to put some of those people back to work. And, and with that being said, uh, he really, the CCC, which he started about six weeks after his inauguration, uh, was one of his pet projects. And that project was to put young men between the ages of 18 to 25 that were unemployed, single, work and to work in the conservation-like atmosphere. So for us, uh, Devil's Den first camp started in October of 33. So it was one of the first camps in the state. And, and with that being said, uh, Often these programs and part of the New Deal were referred to as Roosevelt's uh, alphabet soup because everything was an initial. There's the CCC, there's the PWA, there's WPA, the NRA, National Recovery Act, Farm Security Administration, all that. And so this was just one of the many programs that were uh, Roosevelt had during the New Deal. Now, it was also referred to as Roosevelt Tree Army because they did a lot of conservation work, not only building parks, but did conservation work. And information, it says he, that the CCC's planted up to about 3 billion trees. Everything I've read has been kind of between 2 billion to 4 billion. So I'm going to go down the middle with 3 billion. But that's a lot of trees that they planted. So that's a lot of work that they did. Now, this picture is actually a picture of what was called Camp One. This is before there was really any development in the park. And, and the camps were pretty standardized. Uh, typically, they were about 200 men. They were run by the Army. And, and in particular, the Army was chosen because it was the only uh, federal agency that they knew how to handle large groups of organizations such as this. And so the camps were very almost military-like, or, or it was an army almost lifestyle. And they would have uh, the army run the camp, uh, run the camp. During the day, the work was supervised, especially like at Devil's Den, by the Park Service. And in the evening, the army would kind of take over. So this first camp is 797. First group of men actually came from uh, North Dakota. And some of the first camps, what they would do is they wanted the camps, and actually this is a long ways off kind of what they originally intended, but once they kind of got everything rolling together, and it, it, a lot of these things change later, but the first camps and the camps they sent the enrollees to they wanted to be far enough away 
so they wouldn't get homesick, but close enough that when they could have leave, it was fairly easy to get to their homes. And so camps varied. Originally, I tried to keep them about 200 miles away from where the enrollees came from. That obviously changes later because obviously with this, North Carolina is a lot farther than 200 miles away. But this was to get the first camp established. And then there were several other companies that came in after 797. Uh, and what's real interesting is when a company was there and they brought a new company, they moved that company somewhere else and brought a completely new company in. Now, these guys, the first company, about five miles away from the park where the first camp was located, and it's real close to a place called Zinneman Church. And in fact, at that top picture, if you kind of look at it in the background, you can see a building, and that's the old Zinneman Church, which is still there today. And you can go to that church and look up the field and see where the, uh, the camp used to be. So these guys, they're basically there to build the roads into the park so that eventually they can move in. Now, Arkansas, like a lot of states, got the, the state parks got their start because of the Civilian Conservation Corps. Uh, for Arkansas, there were basically the five parks that were originally CCC camps which were uh, Devil's Den, Lake Catherine, Mount Nebo, Petty Jean, uh, and Crowley's Ridge. And if you want to throw the Buffalo River in there also, uh, which, you know, as you know, later became a National Scenic Waterway. Again, you know, everything's fairly standardized. Young men, 18 to 25, unmarried. But it didn't hold true for everything. Uh, Nebo and Petty Jean actually were for World War I vets. So in that instance, uh, you obviously you could be married, but the others you were not supposed to. And then that bottom picture, which those photos were real popular at the time, kind of gives you an idea of the, uh, the layout and how everything was organized. Now that actual photo came, was donated to us from some people who actually live in uh, Alabama uh, the Ralph Lamb collection, and uh, that we get stuff donated to us, and it really gives us a lot of insight to what was going on at the at the park and the CC at the time. But that photo, you can really see the enrollees. Each camp's about two hundred men, and then the uh, camp commanders in the middle, also with supervisors. And so those supervisors would go out on the job with the enrollees and make sure, obviously, things were being done right. And they'd also hire what was called LEMs, and that said for local experienced men. And those men would help them teach a trade like, oh, uh, masonry, carpentry, uh, a, a variety of things like that. So as you can see with these guys, now actually this picture is you're down in camp two, they're in the park. So we're going to kind of bounce around a little bit, but Army's heavily involved. Army surplus uniforms were used uh, that were issued to them, but they also were issued uh, work clothes. So they're out on the site. But when you weren't working, then you're supposed to really be back in your Army surplus uh, closings that were given to you. Now, here's a shot of the guys getting ready to go to work. And you ended up going in the back of these transport trucks. And I'm not sure that would be allowed today, but that was how they ended up going to the job site. And it's kind of interesting because uh, these guys not only worked, there was time to have fun and they did have dances in the park. And a lot of times they would bring in the local girls. And, you know, it's funny, we got to interview a lot of the CCC uh, guys that were stationed at Devil's Den. And they would tell us, you know, occasionally that they would go the army, I guess, or they'd get somebody to drive some of the army, they call them transport trucks to pick up girls to bring to dances. 
And I envision something else a little bit different than the trucks they're in now. So I'm not sure. I'm going to guess those are the trucks that they use. I, I do have a picture of another one that does show in kind of the back of the truck uh, some boards across. So I guess you could sit down. But that's the way you went to work. And, and your work day consisted of basically you got up about 6 o'clock, get ready for work, uh, time to shower, uh, get dressed, and then uh, by, uh, you had PT starting at 7. It was actually from 6 o'clock, you're up 6.30, dressed to PT. 7 o'clock is breakfast. 7.45, you're out for roll call and off to work. 9 to 1 o'clock, lunch, and usually on the job site. Uh, and then you're back to work from uh, one to four, one to four, then four to five thirty is basically free time or also sports, a variety of activities like that. Five thirty was your evening meal, and then at six thirty, classes were available, and so a lot of them ended up taking classes. Uh, there was an educational director advisor that was there and apple actually one uh the later ones john appleby uh was a fayetteville was from fayetteville was a uh, uh education advisor and he uh was a harvard grad and then later left and came kind of renowned for some writing helping out in world war ii uh but then uh after class was over 9 45 the lights start flashing then 10 o'clock it was lights out so these guys go to work and the first companies, they're building the parks, the roads in and out of the park. So the development can eventually come down into Devil's Den. The camp can be located there. And actually for a brief period of time, there were kind of two companies, uh, 3777 and 3795 that were kind of under operation at the same time. Now, these pictures, which were actually uh, courtesy of the Shiloh Museum, really gave us a lot of insight of what was going on. You have the camp up on top of the hill, and you have the camp. This one in the upper uh, left-hand corner is the camp being developed inside Devil's Den. And you can see the camp is not completed yet, but a lot of lumber's there, so they are getting ready to really get some work done. And so I'm going to guess some of that, a lot of us probably get the camp built, but then also start on the cabins and the infrastructure in the park. And then the bottom picture, which is really interesting, we were never sure if sometimes the enrollees had to stay in tents. Uh, so obviously, out of that picture, they did. Now, they had barracks. They all lived in barracks if barracks were available, but it looks like at least some of them for a brief period of time uh, had to stay in tents. Now, these guys ended up basically getting paid, as they say, a dollar a day and all you could eat. And of the $30 that they made, the $25 of it went home to their families to help them out. And it, it was a lifesaver for them. Uh, a, a lot of the guys have told us if it wasn't for this, their families wouldn't have been able to survive like they did. So once they start moving into the park, they start developing the park, and Devil's Den was built and developed for, for what it is today. It was an area for recreation for people of the area to enjoy. And, you know, it's really interesting. The, the CCC was just you know, a lot of people think it was just here to put these young men to work, give them a job, and help save their families. But it was really much more than that. They were teaching these guys a trade and getting them able to become good members of society. And and the CCs also worked with local companies to if if to help train. Uh, some of the enrollees they could send them there to help if the mechanics if they didn't have some mechanic going on in their place so the program was really broad and really well thought out uh this is a photo of the dams and if y'all have been to the park before you've seen it. its configurations a little bit different than uh it is today not by much 
And the dam was built for the small reservoirs, about an eight acre lake, which is called Lake Devil, kind of keep with the theme. And so uh, much of the rock there, and, and most of it was uh, quarried up on top of the hill. There's, oh, if you leave the park on Highway 74, there's old Forest Service Road, commonly referred to Holt Road. And there's a couple of big quarries out there. And so a lot of the stone for some of the bigger projects were brought down from there. And Highway 74 is the original road. It has not changed. So I'm going to guess it was pretty thrilling to bring a uh, 1930s truck down that hill with all the switchbacks with a load of rock like this coming down through the middle of the park. Uh, and this is show some of the dam construction. And it's really pretty interesting. Uh, Manon Wilson uh, at the U of A with Cass showed me this because I had no in the photo. But if you look real closely at the photo, the way that the boards are lined out, they're one way. So you go one way in, and when you're coming out, bring your wheelbarrow, you go the other way. So you had two way traffic. And kind of see some more construction. You can see the guy in the middle. It's kind of a big uh, concrete sandwich with rock, huge rock courses on each side. And in 1937, uh, you can see that the dam finally was completed and closed. And at 2.30 p.m. on April 1st, the lake started filling up. And I believe the uh, one of the doctors at the park and one of the supervisors bet how long it would take to fill up. And I think the bet was two nickel cigars to see who would win. And I think they might even had to take one of the first win. <laughs> so like, um, part of the project too was to uh, make everything uh, uh, look like it blended in with the local environment. So as you see around Devil's Den and, and, and other parks like us, that if there's a lot of rock and lumber, that's the materials they use. They, they wanted to look like it belonged and uh, belonged in the local environment so that it wasn't obtrusive. And if you've ever been to the park, this is one of the rock walls that you would drive by going towards uh, campground area A. And then, which I'll show on the next slide, the bridge was directly across from that. And these guys are sitting on the directional sign. Each you direct you if you want to go to the campground or the West Fork or uh, into Winslow. And if you can kind of look on the little inset on the bottom right, you know, you have 200 guys there. They're doing hard work, dangerous work at the time. As far as we know, we just had one fatality that was uh, at the park during the period of the park from 1933 to 1942. And if you can kind of look closely in the bottom, kind of left-hand corner of that rock, it's really kind of hard to see, but there's a small cross etched in there. And that was the rock who killed Mr. Cornelius. Uh, and so the his fellow workers etched that into the rock as a uh, to commemorate him and if you drive down to the park we'll be glad to show you where it is because it's still in that wall now right there we're kind of looking directly across from where we were earlier that is the bridge that crossed lee creek at the time uh, if you come to the park now currently the other bridge will be to the left hand side uh, and then on this side of the bridge on the right, that was where the Devil's Den Trailhead was. So if you wanted to go hike the trail uh, and go see the cave, that's where you went. And, and with that being said, not only did these guys build the uh, rock walls, the feats of engineering, cabins so people can stay in, they were also out constructing trails and so our hiking trails, in fact, our two premier trails, the Devil's Sin Trail and the Yellow Rock Trail, were constructed by the Civilian Conservation Corps. Barracks lifestyle. You lived there, you ate there, room and board. Uh, that is a shot one of the barracks. 
getting ready for inspection. And each barracks, you had an area of your own be about six by eight, six by 10 would be what you could call your own space. As you can see, foot lockers were used, uh, keep all your worldly possessions in. And it was pretty much like most barracks, most often, if you slept your head against the wall, the guy next to you's feet was against the wall. So it was head, feet, head, feet, head, feet. And if you look close to the, close on top of that one building, I believe you see one smokestack coming out, chimney. So if you look at those windows, there are not any air conditioning units hanging out. So in the summertime, I can promise you it was probably pretty hot. In the wintertime, it was pretty cold. One of the enrollees, uh, Earl Taylor, well, he decided to make a little bit of money on the side. He got up at 6. So Earl would get up before 6 and stoke the fire to make sure that during the wintertime, the fire was going up enough to maybe warm the barracks just a little bit so that when you got up, it, you'd be a little bit more comfortable. He charged all his barracks mates 10 cents a month to do that. So he had got himself about an extra $3 a month for spending money. And this is a shot inside the uh, mess hall. And mess halls always earn uh, your, your morning meal and evening meal. Uh, very often uh, during work days, you were uh, eating out on the field. And that one mess hall picture on the bottom, that was during the holiday or special event or if they had special visitors. And uh, often, you know, if you didn't get to go home for Thanksgiving or or a holiday, you were there. And so they tried to make it as best as they could. And, and this is a picture of uh, one of the menus. And that was for Thanksgiving. And actually, that's a pretty good meal. But there was a lot of humor that took place during that time. And, you know, it's probably needed. So if you kind of look at that menu, it's really kind of funny. Payday salary, uh, Arkansas regulation fruit salad, uh, roast turkey a la gold brick. And, and very often at uh, programs we have at the park, we always ask somebody if they know what a gold brick is or a gold brick, and no one does. And I'm sure some of y'all remember a gold bricker was somebody who shirked their responsibility. So you didn't want to be known as a gold bricker. Uh, but it's really kind of funny. Individual equipment, ice cream, devil's den cake. And then again, you see the little slogan, we can take it. And you'll find that everywhere. Basically, it meant whatever food they gave us, whatever work they gave us, we can take it. Uh, there's also other little slogans. One was uh, join the CCC and see the world a shovel full at a time. So these guys had to have some humor. And, and, and with that, it's kind of funny. Sometimes if you were a new enrollee, uh, you would probably be harassed a little bit. If you first hard day of work and you were sleeping in and sleeping real hard, you may find your bunk out on the parade ground waking up out there. Uh, or often they would occasionally nail your shoes to the floor. So when you were trying to get out for roll call, it made it a little bit difficult. That's the shot of one of the cabins. That is cabin 16. If you went and looked at it today, it would basically look pretty much the same. Uh, wouldn't have a screen door. Uh, but it, again, if you look at that real closely, it looks like it blends right in with the local environment. And, and that's what they wanted. They wanted it to look like it was part of it. You can see in the gables, the heavy uh, timbering, the rocks coming up about halfway and then with the wood siding from there. The lake, uh, as we kind of looked a little bit earlier at the dam, uh, the lake was uh, uh, originally the swimming area. And so, you know, that was kind of built as the hot spot for the park, the meeting place, the central location of where 
where the park was. And so they built that as kind of the focus point. So originally that's the diving platform. That's an incredible diving platform. So, I mean, everything was built to uh, echo and, and, and look like each other. And very often it's called uh, a park architecture because they were used in parks and the rustic look of it, but that it was also part of the environment. And you're kind of looking also at the same area from a little bit different angle. Uh, these ladies are sitting on the dam and they're looking back towards the diving platform. Uh, you can see the rock wall and there's a couple of entrances that you can walk into the lake. Uh, if you can kind of see the post there, the ballards, it has a lifeline through it. So actually that part of the lake is, is concrete. And so that was your shallow area. And over on kind of the uh, right-hand corner, midway down, there was a beach there. Uh, so it, it was the area that you wanted to go to that all your friends would be. And, and you kind of look in the background and see part of the, what was called the combination building, which now is the store and restaurant. Uh, and then lining the lake, you can see the uh, benches. And those benches are still underneath the pavilion uh, up at the store. It, it, was, it was all encompassing. I mean, a, kind of a turnkey operation. At the cabins, you can see exterior lights were built by uh, the enrollees. There was a door strapping. They had a blacksmith shop. The furniture, which is some incredible furniture that we still use in the cabins, uh, was built on site and for usage in the cabins uh, and, and the cabins themselves uh what is just so phenomenal about that is the landscape they had a landscape architect on staff and that he then would go in and landscape around the cabins and the buildings and they would end up using uh local plants so everything blended in that's a shot of a probably early 1940s, maybe late 1930s, uh, linen postcard of the park and of the swimming area. And it's real interesting because it has uh, Devilson State Park, 15 miles northwest of Mount Gaylor. And at the time, Mount Gaylor was kind of one of the hopping spots. And so if you were enrollee, couldn't have a car, but about two switchbacks up from the current visitor center, there was a place they called the hole. And at the hole, they would hide their cars. So I'm guessing if you were a guy, you had a car, you were pretty popular. Because otherwise, to get to town, you either had to walk, hitch a ride, or no, someone has a car. And so I believe one of them said they would charge him a quarter to go into town. So, you know, quarter's pretty, pretty good part of your paycheck if you're just getting five bucks. But I'm sure it was all well worth it. Now, Orville, who I had mentioned earlier, what he said he would do, they would sneak around at night and go siphon gas out of the army trucks they go put it in their cars so that later they could end up going to town. And here's a shot of the combination building, which you can kind of see through the woods. Uh, when the today that houses our store, and and if that big lawn in front of us where the swimming pool is, they no longer swim in the lake. And over on the kind of the left hand side is the pavilion. The, then that swimming, uh, the front of the store was where you came and you could exchange, uh, get a basket uh, to go swim and put your stuff in. There was a clerk there, an attendant that would take it that you could come back later. You probably had a pen that you pinned on your swimming suit. And the kind of the extension on the left, that was the women's changing area. And right behind the front entrance was the men's changing area. And then later in back was for our restaurant and saying that was originally a restaurant area for food service. Sports was important, and uh, the uh, Devil's Den Angels was the uh, 
baseball team, and not only did they do sports, basketball, uh, track, they would box. And this is uh, the little uh, story on top. They're getting ready to go play the uh, Tawny Town team, and that was for the beginning of the Great Festival. And I got a little information from Eileen Bashirs at the Tawny Town Museum on that, and I think that Tawny Town won, uh, but it's real kind of interesting. Uh, the manager, Krillick, is uh, also the uh, landscape architect, but sports were real big, and they wanted sports as part of the program. I'm going to guess most of you have been on the Devil's Den Trail and have hiked the trail, and for what the park is named, uh, that is the Devil's Den Cave. So that is what it looked like in uh, the mid-30s, and I don't believe it has changed much since then. Of course, while they were there, you know, the camp, you had to uh, supply the camp with, with water, uh, things like that, you know. So this is actually when you drive through the park, you'll see these buildings kind of rambling. Going, well, what, what was that used for? Well, that is down by the lake. And that was the original pump house. And if you look over kind of on the right-hand corner, you can see the water It went to the lake and they pump water from there, chlorinated, then sent it off to an uh, uh, underground tank. And then there's also a water tower too. Now, eventually 3795 moves into the park and the camp's there. Uh, these guys, you know, you signed up for six months, uh, and usually the average stay was about two years. Now, it's really kind of funny. Uh, Hubert Nicholas told us once that he, in the mid-30s, he, he was from a small town in Arkansas, and he said he was running with a bad crowd, and he was going to get in trouble. And so his dad ended up going talking to the county judge to see if he could get him in the CCCs, get him enrolled. And he said, County Judge says, yes, I'll, I'll be glad to help you out. Uh, so, um, and he got him in. He said, but one thing you had to do for me, he said, that $25 that come home to you has got to go to me. <laughs> he said that lasted a little while, but not too long. But Hubert was a great guy. So those guys are on the left-hand side of the park. And now we have panned all the way across. And this is inside Devil's Den day use area. And we're looking at a barracks behind. And they're probably out for roll call getting ready to go out. So you've the, the camp is in the park. And you there's a trail, the CCC uh, uh, conservation trail that you can hike with that will take you through where the old camp is located. Uh, because a lot of that stuff was used later and, and talking about the cabins, some of the cabins were built for uh, what we call uh, uh, overnight cabins. And those were, some of them were built as duplexes. And so something they've now made into one cabin. You look and see there were two entries for those cabins. And if you visited the park in probably, oh, 1940, Overnight cabin would cost you $1.50 a night. Also, then they had the housekeeping cottages, as they were called, and those were, you know, for families that would have kitchens, things like that. This picture is kind of interesting because I always ask if I'm at the amphitheater showing this, going, hey, uh, can you guess where this is? And everybody will thank the old wreck building's chimney, which is down in the use area, but it's not. There was plans uh, to build another lake. And so that is actually the overflow tower, which is still there. And if you go into campground uh, area A and look across from campsite 13, you'll see no flume that comes out. If you hopped on top of it and walked back, you walk back to this overflow tower. And the far end of area A2 is this huge earthen embankment. And that was the beginning of another lake they were getting ready to build. And the other lake was going to be approximately 25 acres. Uh, but with the advent of World War II, the CCs basically ended. 
And these guys, a lot, very, a lot of them that uh, were in the camps ended up being going and fighting in uh, World War II and joined the armed services. Uh, it, it was a real benefit to the country in that these guys were already ready and, and used to a, a, a barracks lifestyle. One of the CC guys, Joe Copeland, told us that he joined because he knew that we were getting ready to go to war and he wanted to be prepared as best he could. That is a picture of Devil's Den. Oh, probably, let's say about 1938. In the center of the picture, you'll see the diving platform. And that's the lake around it. If you go from the left there, that is the combination building where the uh, dressing was, rooms were, and the uh, 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 cafe. And then if you go to the right of that, kind of along the lake is uh, the education building. And then in the far right, you're going to see kind of a group of three buildings or some kind of stand up. It looks like on a tripod. That was a rock crusher. And then that long building is the maintenance building. And down below is where the furniture was made and the blacksmith shop. If you kind of come back this way, that kind of loan building, that is the uh, where the Army kept their trucks. Next to it was the rec hall, where today, if you come to the park, is where the chimney is. And from there, if you see the four buildings kind of in a row long, those were barracks. Then in the middle, commissary, hospital, uh, mess hall. The other side of it was latrine. And then that group of four buildings is uh, more barracks. And then if you can look up into the woods, you'll see the cabins. So on a snowy day, if you came to Devil's Den, that's what it would look like. And this picture is taken somewhere from, uh, oh, probably up towards the Yellow Rock Trail area. And that photo by G. Gordon Snyder, or photo painting, is in the Smithsonian. And if you can kind of look past it, it's, it's almost at the same view as the uh previous photo, you can see part of the camp behind it. And documenting the uh, park and the work that was being done was very important. And so he documented some of it by pictures and painted them. That also gave somebody a job, an artist a job. And if you're ever down at Patty Jean at Mather Lodge, you can look inside and he later went to Mather Lodge and some of those photos are uh, in there. And that is a picture of some of the young men who helped build Devil's Den. Right in the middle is Kelly Kramer. He later became one of the first park uh, superintendents. And he was a, what was commonly called then a dog robber at some time, which was an orderly that served the, the army. Raymond Wilkie's on the far right. And next to him is uh, Roy Lister. Roy was the mess sergeant, and Roy had a budget of 33 cents a day to feed an enrollee three meals. Uh, if you look on the other side of uh, where Kelly is, that's Orville Taylor. So uh, make sure you have a gas cap lock on or something. He may be coming after yours. And then on the far end is Sparky, who is also one of the cooks. All these guys. We got to meet, uh, as from a picture from one of the reunion, we were able to get a fantastic amount of oral history from them. Uh, it was incredible work that they did. They were very proud of it, helped keep their families alive, and uh, they were just a fantastic group. And Devil's Den, in fact, is one of the most intact uh, Civilian Conservation Corps camps in the state uh of course like most of them were on the national register of historic places and if you go around the park probably today 60 to uh 70 percent of the park is what it was originally 
you know, buildings and in peace engineering. Uses have changed a little bit. If you come to the visitor center, the visitor center was where the park surface uh, kept their vehicles. It was their motor court. But the cabins were built as they were and, and have changed some. We don't have duplexes anymore, but we're built for people to come and enjoy the outdoor along with the trails. Uh, today at Devil's Den, we get uh, basically about half a million people to come and visit the park. But without these guys' great works, uh, Devil's Den wouldn't wouldn't be as it is. And, and a lot of state parks. In fact, they say about 700 state parks got their start because of the Civilian Conservation Corps. Um, we do have a picture, a picture, a picture of our statue, commonly referred to as Iron Mike, but it's really the spirit of the CCC is the name of it. And it's, we, it's just there to commemorate the work, the legacy uh, that, that they built and built for us to enjoy. And with that being said, uh, I want to thank you for attending the program. I'm sure there may be some questions afterwards. Uh, Rachel and the uh, Shiloh Museum and some of the photos that I used were theirs. Uh, also, uh, Angie Payne, Manon Wilson, and Kimball Erdman uh, with the university, they have been doing a lot of work on a project, and we have learned a lot. And, and always continue to learn. I've been at the park for 30 some years and there is always something new that'll come up. I'll just go, wow, I didn't know that was there. I didn't know that. So it's always a learning experience. They were there nine and a half years, nine years. So there's always a lot of stuff that went on. Uh, with that, please ask questions. If not, come to Devil's Den. Yeah. Yeah. Hello. Hi. Hello. Jim, it's Kathleen Duxbury. We met back in 2010. Gordon and I came to Devil's Den to research George Gordon Snyder, the artist. Yes, Kathleen, I do. And I should have notice that we're here and when i showed the snyder painting i should have mentioned your name and all the good works that you've done no no but i think at least next to me on my screen is mark humple and it's mark humple who is the person responsible for the art of george gordon snyder that we okay. pieced together because of the smithsonian piece so, oh wow well that is great and I have had a chance to, uh, I was down in Little Rock, <coughs> it's been a little while, but see the painting that is down at the archives there. Right. And right. I, I will say, I will apologize. I've been meaning to go up because I think I know the area where that was taken, where he painted, but I need to go up there and take a picture to send to you, but I need to wait till this fall. No, you know, no apologies. I you just gave us a trip down a beautiful trip to a beautiful park. <laughs> and thank you so much. It was wonderful. Absolutely wonderful, Tim. Well, so good, good. And you Mark, know. nice to meet you. Too. I just, nice yeah. to meet you. Thank you. Well, good. I'm glad y'all joined in. Thank you. Hey, y'all, y'all please shoot me an email. And that way, uh, I'll have that because it looks like okay. we're always looking for any information that we can and, and things and history of the park. And y'all look like a great resource. Right. Beautiful park, beautiful history. It's uh, remarkable what the CCC did. Their accomplishments are just amazing. Amazing. Oh, it's, and it's, it's wonderful. You know, it's also wonderful that Arkansas really embraces their CCC history and honors it. So it's a wonderful, you know, a wonderful testament to the state and what they do. And thank you. Thank well, you from us. There kind of something exciting, I guess I can say this, is eventually this project with the University of Cast, uh, they are going to have a web page with a lot. We have hundreds of photos and they're going to put those online. Wonderful. Wow. So that will be available. 
Mm -hmm. And that is the future online. Thank you. I'm not I'm gonna stop talking now. It looks like there's other people. Good to see you. Hello, Mark. Good to see you. Hi guys. That's Are there any other questions, comments? You can type them in the chat or you can turn your volume or turn your microphones on either way. Hey, Tim, this is our Lord. Hi, how are you? Thank you. Good, thank you for your presentation. Just a quick question. I know that CCC had uh, black members, but looking at your pictures and knowing what I know, I'm guessing that none, that, that all of the CCC in, in, at uh, Devil's Den were white. Is that correct? That is correct. The camps were segregated. Uh, I, I do have a uh, uh, at the park a booklet that has all the camps in the state, and there were several camps uh, in Arkansas that were African American camps, uh, mostly in eastern Arkansas. I believe there was one at Strong and and several others, but no, unfortunately, all the camps uh, were segregated and. As bad as that was, at least there was at the same pay, same opportunity, if you can say that's good, if you, if you get what I mean. Right, yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for tonight and for all the work you did on the exhibit. So I'm getting lots of thank yous. Oh, good. Yeah. Well, thank you, Tim, so much for coming tonight. And thank you all for joining us for our Not Strictly History. Um, check in on our webpage and our social media to see what else we're up to. Y'all have a nice night. Thank you all.